My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Let's continue the trend, Jim, where we talk about uh, creating the comic book. This time is the Marvel method. Before, we took a look at how they did it in 1973 for DC Comics. Let's take a look at 1993 for Marvel. Perfect. But first... Yes. I am now on Patreon. Please follow me at patreon.com slash jimrug. I have, uh, I'm showing off Street Angel because I serialized a lot of these comics on that Patreon, but I have out-of-print mini-comics and zines available as PDFs for download there. Lots of process stuff, lots of art, writing, Q&As, things of that nature, even occasionally notes on uh, episodes of Kayfabe. I posted all of my Flex Mentalo notes on there uh, not too long ago. So check that out, patreon.com slash jimrug. Patreon.com slash Ed is where I'm serializing my current comics project, Red Room. You can see right there, man, that's the logo treatments that haven't made the cut. This one definitely didn't, man. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Murder on the dark web for fun and profit, Jimmy. And uh, you need to wear masks and costumes if you're going to be murdering people on the dark web, even if it is an anonymous platform. Uh, but there's a couple so pages. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I uh, have two stories up there at this very moment. I put up new strips every Tuesday, and three bucks gets it all. Easy peasy, Jimmy. Now, this book that we're looking at, I think we'll do a bigger video on it uh, at some other point. Lost my dust jacket, but this is the Abrams History of Marvel book, tw 25th anniversary, I think. Uh, came out like night. Actually, it came out right after uh, Spider Man 1 came out wow. because there's no mention of X Force and there's no mention of uh, X Men, of course. But we do get Mike Sainz. Yes, we do, man. <laughs> look at look at the McFarlane pencils to inks, by the way. Yeah, very cool. We're going to do this book sometime, man. Let's stick to the task at hand: creating the comic book by way of the Marvel method, and uh, it begins. By the way, this is all kayfabe. This is a kayfabe article. I sure, think. yeah, absolutely. And it's very bare bones, but begins with. The editorial meeting between writer and editor. In this case, Howard Mackey, Bobby Chase. Maybe one of the first times that I got to take a look at the people who actually make the comics that, that I've been reading. Because I was definitely a mark for Ghost Rider, man. Yeah, I dug Ghost Rider at that time period. You know, you, you talk about this being bare bones, and sure, but it was the right time for for. Me. Me too. Um, I mean, I was like 10 years old when I, I got nothing. this book. You know, this is sort of pre-internet and stuff, early 90s, that this book would have come out. So just a glimpse of this was revealing, and it, and it helped. It just helped to understand stuff. If I were trying to make comics, it's like, okay, write, write out your story. You know, get, get your plot figured out. This is what pencils look like. You know, like baby steps, incremental, you know? It's perfect. And this is a first glimpse of Marvel Method. So you don't see panel one this, panel that. You read... Five descriptions, and you see three panels, four panels. So it's like, you know, the penciler makes it work. I thought that image was incredible, and this photo was everything to me because it was about the drawing of comics that, that was my interest at that time, man. And looking at this little, this little studio space that I think is probably in the Marvel bullpen. <laughs> I think they called Mark Tex in and said, hey, sit down, uh, let's snap a couple pics of you. Because I, I wanted all of these tools. Like, it, clearly these tools wouldn't be here if it wasn't uh, for com making comics. So I zeroed in close and was like, I need this little machine. You know Where can what, I man, get that desk? I might have that exact light table. I do have it. <laughs> yeah, it's a light box. Right. And uh, it's sitting on my drafting table right at this very minute. That's hilarious. Here's why I think it's a kayfabe image, man. Because we have the color separations plates of covers that he didn't even do. Yeah, right. You know, that's a Jim Lee. Uh, and that might be Lee Weeks back there or JRJR. And it's all the color seps. Like, you see the registration marks. You see the CMYKs, man. And there's probably either four or nine uh, uh, acetates on there. Uh, this is the page that they're showing off i think um <laughs> but then I'm, I'm like well what's that right there and the answer is that's paper cement for you to do your paste ups uh on stuff light box i see scissors some old ratty brushes higgins ink yeah that's the big professional size bottle too so here's the here's the process man oh look he's got a toothbrush maybe this is mark texas uh space splatter Pencils. I love those pencils. So, you know, like you mentioned, I was into Ghost Rider at this time, too. Yeah. 
and his style was very different than a lot of the popular styles I was into. Uh, his approach to light and, and to inking, very different. And so seeing these pencils was really great because I had seen a little bit of pencils at this point. This would have been, I don't know, maybe Wizard starts right after this, but you'd see stuff in comic scene. You might see some pencils here and there. Seeing his pencils was really instructive to me because his drawing style was different. Yeah, man, and it's like a scratchy style. Uh, to see it develop from this to what we see on the next page, phenomenal. And uh, the Love lettering, mm -hmm. can't, can't skip that part, man. I still have tape on yeah. my Ames guide that I probably, I probably bought an Ames guide, you know, the month after I got this book <laughs> and made sure to put tape on it, try to investigate, try to get z super close to try to see exactly the uh, size that I need to set the thing at. I think it's like four and a half. But see in Janice's hand, uh, she's one of the letterers that I was able to tell from the rest uh, first at this era. Now, once again, I think this is kayfabe stuff because like the hallmarks of her lettering from this period, uh, ink bleeds on the on the ends of all of her lines from marker or something. And this is like a dip pen. Yeah, I have all these pen pens and they're like the C, the C pens, so yeah. like C one to six, and that's just the numbers are the size of the pens. I've lettered comics with those. Um, I don't. That's not what I letter with now. Yeah, is a, a, because I don't love them. <laughs> they're right. a little bit tough to use, but uh, probably same deal. Like I probably recognize those pen nibs from from a photo like this, where it's like, okay, that's the right kind of pens. You know, it's different than a Hunt One Hundred Two. Right. You know, go track these down and try them. So, check this out, though, Jimmy. I met Janice Chang at uh, New York uh, Comic Con 2017, and uh, we hung out. Like when I saw her walking by. I, I, like, hit her up. I was like, are you Janice Chang? And I'm like, when I was a little dude, like, I basically started reading when uh, Ghost Rider came out. And she sat with me for, like, two hours. Man, oh, man, and, that's cool. And we, we were kicking it. She, that's where she told me that she was the letterer for Silent Interlude, the silent uh, Snake Eye story, and got paid for the whole issue. And then uh, this shows up in the mail, you know, so, sometime later, man, in the Ghost Rider font. Yeah, that's, that's dope, awesome. right? That's really awesome, yeah. Dude, are letters, like, is the profile of letters that they're really cool and nice? I feel like they all the letters that I've met I like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe, man. Now it's time for inking. So you know I'm taking a look super close. These are probably those, like, carcinogenic markers that aren't on the market anymore. <laughs> you know? Like, I can almost smell them just looking at them. Man, I love seeing that inked page. He was so good, or is so good, with that black and white, like the values and stuff. Yeah. And that page looks amazing, you know, with the, with the solid black and whites. So good. Absolutely, man. And look at that. He's using that cheap that cheap uh, Higgins ink inkwell. Not only that, I hate that inkwell. I know. Like, it's so even if I use that kind of ink, I dump it into a different jar that has a wider mouth. Yeah. And and that you can see into. You know, sure. like you're just you're just dipping your brush. How do you know how far to push your brush in? Right. You that's an issue. The narrowness. Now you're getting ink all yeah. over the, the top part, you're getting it on your fingers. It's very weak. Come on, Mark. <laughs> Get a better ink well. <laughs> Coloring the page. Doc Martin Zinc dies. Never saw these things in a wild. I don't know that there was one place in Pittsburgh where you could buy Doc Martin dies in 1992 or three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's that's a tool I've never owned. I've never touched a Doc, Doc Martin die. I've used Doc Martin inks, but not the dies. You, uh, you could see where it, I talk about the stuff being high octane. It's a die. The same stuff that you put on your Easter eggs, man. It's not a paint. Uh, I was asking on previous videos, like, why the heck would they choose this and not some other medium? And a colorist from uh, from Valiant, apologies for not remembering the name, um, but they hypothesize that it's because uh, you can retain the black ink line over top. You know what I mean? If you even used watercolor, there's potential that uh, it would it would um, go over the black line a little bit. And you have to put more watercolor on. It would make the paper buckle. 
That's a, that, I love this too. I think that that looks so great. And I love how vibrant those are, man. Like that pink sky. Wow. Yeah, for sure, man. And look, dude, he's not a dumb colorist. Here's all the warm colors. Got the blue in the background to sort of make the, the fire pop. Yeah, and the fire being the hottest, the brightest, the yellow, and then the skin going back to the oranges and the reds. Yeah, very smart. So now your, your pages are done, all that stuff. <laughs> like, of course this ain't more Texas. But now now you got to have John, Jazzy John Romita go over your stuff with a fine-tooth comb and dress you down. Yeah, I, I have a feeling this doesn't happen on every page. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think Jazzy John wanted to get his picture in the, in the Marvel book. Yeah. Yeah, I think if something needed done, you hand it to the bullpenner and it's like, redraw that skull. Yeah, speaking of bullpenners, let's take a look at the bullpen. Paste that skull over top. Let's take a look at the bullpen, man. That's really fun to see. Does that look glamorous? Anytime you would talk to somebody about bullpens, they always would go out of their way to explain how little it was and how not like it is in our imaginations. Right. But it's great to see it. Like, I love seeing it. I would, anytime you'd see an image, it would be a big deal. Like, Marie Severin on that one Foom cover draws kind of the Marvel offices and I'd just pour over that thing. Absolutely, man. Uh, the photography, the the way they set their shutter, that's pretty fun, man, because it creates that illusion of speed. Even though, because it is a comic-making facility, ain't too many people moving that much. <laughs> <laughs> like, they were trying to cap capture hustle bustle, and it's like, well, okay, you might get some blurry hands. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Flexographic printing on a web press was the print du jour at this very moment. And there's just like a little glimpse of that. I would have liked to see that in a little bit greater detail, man. Like let's let's see let's see each of those plates get get some color application and see how that looks. But look at that man, just churning out it, number ones. Is that, is that X Men X Men one <laughs> on the press right there? Yeah, it's such a great image. The the output part there is really what is uh, the nice dramatic part. Obviously, it'd be easy to show a little bit more of like those pages coming off and stuff, which is a pretty fun thing if you ever go see a printing press, especially like one a web press or something like that that's really kicking out volume. Always kind of cool to see that stuff, but uh, that's not bad. That makes sense to me. You know, definitely not getting into detail of the printing side, but by the 90s, you know, it's not long from here that we're going just digital, digital, digital. And yeah, all, all of this is negated. It separates it even further. Here's your printed page. This book was awesome, and whenever they expanded it to have like all those other dark, cold kind of whatever the line was, Midnight I, it just Suns. ruined it. It just you know kind of just diluted it to nothing. You weren't a fan of Night Stalkers. Te Texiera moved on to I don't know Punisher and Wolverine and Union and all those other things, but there was magic in that first Ghost Rider relaunch. Yeah, and he was on it for well, it was Javier Sotaris to begin with. I think Tex was his inker or mm -hmm. finisher or something like that. And then slowly kind of took it over. But he was on that book for like 25 issues. Yeah. That's a long run back then. So after the printed page, man, the comic shop. And at this time, there are 4,000 comic shops. That ain't going to last very long. Jim Hanley's. Doesn't it look like Walden Books, though? It does a little bit, yeah. Guys, this, I know I got some Jim Hanley customers in the audience. Was this really Jim Hanley's? Because I'm saying this looks a lot like Walden Books. I guess it is all pop culture-y type shits, man. I guess. I, I can't quite tell. You ever go to Jim Han Hanley's? Mm-mm. No. I'm trying to think if I did or not. I, I feel like I either went to it or whenever it sold or transferred over to whatever it became, I may have gone then. Anyhow, man. How, how comics were done the Marvel way in 1991. Pretty straightforward process. Yeah. I don't I don't know that there's any big secrets revealed there. Like you said, Ed, you know, you pour over those photos and try to see tools and things like that. That would have been the main uh, the main revelations for me at the time is just try to see those tools. And it looks nice. You know, like that was the other part. Seeing any kind of page in process, I can't stress how rare that was. Like sure. it was really important to see these pages as they went through the process you know, that's, I learned a lot from looking at pages anytime I'd encounter them, whether it was reproduced here or, you know, under, underneath a table at Pittsburgh Comic Con or something. Yeah. Uh, seeing that stuff really kind of helped make sense to me of what I was trying to aim for. It's about division of labor too, you know, script. Uh, the, the lettering, I think, is probably the big revelation to a lot of people. If yes. not for putting the lettering on after the penciling, for the fact that they're the ones who ink the panel borders. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyhow, I'm good. You good? Yep. All right, K-Favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What you got, Jimmy? Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Uh, check that out. I'm uh, posting comics, art, uh, PDF downloads of old zines and out-of-print mini comics, things of that nature. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Serialized in the Red Room Comics. Two issues are up there right now. Uh, new strips every Tuesday. And three bucks will get you that archive. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we are doing. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. I just realized this is one of my favorite issues of What If that we might have to get under the microscope. <laughs> and give them some more marching orders, Jimmy. Make more comics.